for how you're going to meet those needs over a 20-year time frame. I think uh, this, this plan is a little bit different for us and, and probably more important than ever, and the biggest reason for that is the acceleration of technology. If you tuned in last week, you heard from Kirk Seidel, former Michigan DOT director, he talked a lot about this, this acceleration of technology and the opportunities that it presents us in transportation to really improve mobility and safety, the, the key functions of what a transportation network provides. Uh, to, to be able to take technology and make improvements in those areas is really exciting. And I think the challenge and the key with technology is the uncertainty that comes with it. And as a government organization, how do you take the leap? How do you invest? When do you invest? Those are questions that are difficult, and as, te as technology accelerates, it makes it even more challenging. I think for us, the long-range transportation will help us because it's going to explore the influences and the scenarios that will help shape those opportunities and really set the guideposts for us in Nebraska. So we're ready to deliver a transportation system that will serve Nebraskans and Nebraska businesses, you know, today but in the decades to come. I think this tech forum is uh, it, this series is a fun part of that exploration that we bring in experts from around the country really to challenge our thinking and help us imagine what's possible here in Nebraska. And so uh, I want to get to the panelists. Before I do that, I want to thank all of you who are joining us. Uh, you know, your, your interest in transportation, your partnership, you know, these partnerships are the key to the success of the DOT. And when I think about the communities, the leaders, the legislative leaders, business leaders, interest groups, industry partners, you know, it truly is our collective success when we make investments that are smart and that serve the people of, of Nebraska and give the transportation system that Nebraskans rely on, need, and, and frankly deserve. So our success is your success, and we can't thank you enough for being here today and for the partnerships that are so strong that are really helping us at DOT serve uh, our state. So with that, back to you, Curtis. Uh, thank you, Kyle. Uh, the first thing I'd like to do this morning is I'd like to introduce Courtney Ehrlichman. Courtney is a, uh, she's a subconsultant on this project, that's on the statewide LRTP that we're working on, and then specifically she's helping out with, with, the, uh, with this here tech forum, and she's had a tall task in front of her because initially we were doing this in person back in March, and then, and then we ran into some obstacles, so we've had to shovel some things around doing this you know, by, by webinar, and uh, so I definitely want to send a big thank you out to her. Um, Kelsey, could you pull up her slide for me? Thank you. Um, Courtney Ehrlichman, is, she's the founder and CEO of the Ehrlichman Group. Uh, she spent over 10 years working with Carnegie Mellon University. She's got a TEDx talk out there that you can find on YouTube. Um, she's a Carnegie Mellon alumna herself. Uh, Courtney is fantastic. She's a, a definite uh, subject matter expert in this field, and she's been a joy to work with. Uh, so definitely thank uh, um, uh, thank Courtney for, for this. Uh, she's done a great job getting an excellent group of panelists that I am very excited to share with you today. Um, and then going on from, from Courtney, she's going to be helping us actually a little bit uh, with some facilitation of discussion after the presentations are over. So you'll hear her come in and ask some questions on, on the back end of these presentations. Um, with that, I would like to introduce our, our first speaker who does not appear is, is on yet. Uh, so I think what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to skip over Sue for the time being, and we'll come back to her once she gets signed in. And, uh, and Kelsey, could you skip ahead to David Schaller's presentation? What we'll do is we'll go ahead and we'll have David give his presentation. He's going to talk just a little bit about changes that are going to happen in the, in the trucking industry. And uh, Dave is uh, an excellent, excellent um, uh, subject matter expert in his field. Uh, He's the Industry Engagement Director for the North American Council for Freight Efficiency. His responsibilities include interfacing with fleets and suppliers, writing reports, conducting workshops, giving presentations, maintaining the NACFE's fleet database, and running social media groups. Uh, Dave works closely with the drivers and the sponsors on the Run on Less demonstration events. Uh, David is a Purdue Boilermaker, but we won't hold that against him today. Um, he's also a Ball State Cardinal. He earned his electrical engineering degree from Purdue, and he's got a master's in business from Ball State. Uh, he worked for Navistar uh, for 27 years, and he held uh, positions there in production design, research program management, dealer sales training, marketing, uh, product line management, and uh, strategic product planning. Uh, a marketing role allowed for Dave to spend many days in truck stops, fleet offices, and dealerships in five different nations learning about what the industry desired and why they desired it. Uh, Dave holds five U.S. patents. He's written several uh, SAE papers and numerous uh, publications for the North American Council for Freight Efficiency. 
Uh, North American Council for Freight Efficiency, the NACFE, is a nonprofit group working to double the fuel economy of fleets. They research and publish confidence reports and guidance documents on over 80 technologies available in the industry. Their annual fleet fuel study reports on industry trends over the past decade and points to the, uh, to the, to the way to GHG Phase II compliance. And you can find him on, on their website, nacfe.org, and you can see all of the different changes going on in their industry there. Uh, with that, so please welcome David Schaller. David, I'm going to hand it off to you. Thank you. Appreciate it. I love this opportunity to talk to some fellow Midwesterners and uh, talk about the absolute trailer full of changes that are coming to trucking right now. So if you'd flip to the, my opening slide, please. Uh, for the last two years, NACFI has been working on electrification. And we put out our first report in May of 2018 on electric trucks, where they make sense first. And I'll help you skip over that. The where they make sense first is our second report, medium duty electric trucks. Uh, the cost of ownership there is an opportunity for folks that are running uh, urban routes and whatnot, um, probably not the, in a lot of Nebraska, but in your major urban areas in Lincoln and whatnot. Yeah, definitely. The third report we did was on electric trucks charging infrastructure. This is not like charging your Prius or your Bolt or your whatever it is you've got in your garage that's electric. We're talking about class seven and eight trucks that could take a megawatt for charging. So uh, there's a big opportunity for change in the charging systems. Uh, the last report that we just put out at the end of last year is on viable class seven and eight electric hybrid and alt fuels trucks. These used to be expensive reports. We got two new philanthropic sponsors this year that said NACBI make them free of charge. So these are now available to you free of charge on our website. Next slide, please. One more click. In uh, the current situation we're in in 2020, legacy diesels dominate the trucking industry, quite frankly. And yes, natural gas, CNG, and LNG have a role now. They're both there. There are a lot of immature technologies that are coming into the scene that we're going to talk about today. You give me one more click. We're now into what NACFI likes to refer to as the messy middle that we expect is going to last for at least two decades that we will be busy optimizing solutions, growing infrastructures. Uh, there'll be a lot of innovations going on, a lot of brilliant people working on these things. Uh, we've got an opportunity in the next few coming years to start having facts replacing estimates because we've got actual vehicles and actual data. So there's going to be a lot of change in the next two decades, maybe it might even take three decades. One more click as we get out into 2040 and beyond, we see a situation where we're going to have a lot more fast charging we suspect batteries will go through the same kinds of changes cell phone batteries did, that we'll get longer life, lower cost, acceptable weights. And in about two to three decades, we're gonna be operating commercial battery electric vehicles as well as hydrogen fuel cell vehicles from predominantly clean energy. So the industry is going to go through a lot of change. Next slide, please. for medium and heavy duty vehicles, that we have all kinds, we've predominantly gasoline and diesel, as I've mentioned, but we blend them with biodiesel to support our corn and corn soybean industries and whatnot with ethanol, methanol, renewable diesel is making it come at the industry, a lot of gaseous fuels, but the real development, uh, shocking areas are battery electric and hydrogen hybrids and whatnot that there are a whole series of hybrids, whether they're diesel, gas, CNG, hydrogen, even for trailers, nitrogen. Now, so not many people can put together this whole list of uh, fueling options for medium and heavy duty trucks off the top of their head. It took us a little while and a little investigation to get all this put together. Next slide, please. For those of you that aren't real familiar with the trucking industry, I want to strongly encourage you to download our report from April of 2019 on Regional Hall. A lot of people, when they think about heavy duty trucks, think uh, Smokey and the Bandit making cross country run with Coors beer or whatever it is. And the reality is that half, nearly half, 45% of class eight tractors that are ordered in the US are actually A cabs. They, no one sleeps in them. 
These trucks are doing regional haul operations and a lot of sleeper trucks also do regional haul operations where there's hardly ever a driver sleeping in it. There's a drop in the average length of haul. There's an enormous growth of warehousing and e-commerce. There's a lot of big data technology trends. Prior to COVID, there was an enormous driver shortage in the truck industry. And regional haul also has an enormous opportunity for alternative fuels that don't worry about having an infrastructure across the country. If you're running trucks out of the same depot or distribution center every day, the opportunity to use alternative fuels goes up dramatically. You know where that truck's going to get fueled every day. So this information is available to all of you out there anytime. Next slide, please. To help the industry understand this, in fall of uh, 2019, we staged what we call run on less demonstrations that we do every other year. And this past year, we focused on regional hall. And if you look at that vertical blue bar there, CNS, Wholesale Grocers, Hirschbach, Hogan, JB Hunt, Meyer, PepsiCo, Ploger, Schneider, Southeastern Freight Lines, United Parcel Service, all brought their best tractor, best trailer, and one of their best drivers to this demonstration. And you can go to runonless.com and you can look at any one of these individual fleets on any of the 18 days and slide the uh, day bar that's circled in red there back and forth so you can see what actual duty cycles look like. The bottom line that came out of all of this is that your average uh, regional haul tractor gets about six miles per gallon. These 10 fleets threw down 8.3 miles per gallon with these vehicles. So they were. 30% better than uh, the typical vehicle. Actually, there was one CNG truck in here that was pulling down the average. If you just look at the nine diesel trucks, they were at 8.7 miles per gallon. And two years previous to this, we did a run on less long haul demonstration. And those trucks that were doing the cross Nebraska interstate type of routes were putting down 10.1 miles per gallon. So there are enormous opportunities for improvement just with production options that are available today to diesel trucks. Next slide, please. Just last week, we finally got through all 10 telematic systems, all 10 data recorders, and put together a report on the event that's now don't downloadable at uh, the website shown in the middle there. Regional haul tractors, 800,000 of them across North America, consume roughly 8 billion gallons of diesel fuel a year. That's Yes, that's a huge number. But if you look at the percentage improvement we saw, there's every reason to believe we can pull that down to 5.5. And as we look at electrification, we have every reason to believe uh, maybe it could be even as low as 1 billion in the future. So there's a lot of opportunities here and this report will help guide you through everything we learned about regional hall optimization uh, during the run last year. Next slide, please. The conclusions in that report, high efficiency takes a commitment from the fleets uh, optimizing includes using big data and connectivity, understanding and acting on the wide variety of duty cycles. Trucks do not all do the same things in the same way, and that's really hard for people to understand. It's not like passenger cars at all. Drivers are attracted to these types of opportunities, and return to base, as I mentioned, is ideal for electric and other alternative fuels. So this growth in regional haul is a good thing. If you're wondering about how would these tractors look in the real world if they were a battery electric truck. NREL, the National Renewable Energy Labs, released a report with us last week on battery electric powertrains for these 10 vehicles if we switched them over. Not to be outdone, we worked with Ballard on hydrogen fuel cells, so that report's available. And if you just like the, the data set to be more knowledgeable on trucking operations, we've got that available as well. Next slide, please. NACFI has been working for 10 years now with fleets, with OEM suppliers, dealerships, government entities, DO, DOE, DOTs, et cetera, collaborating on what works, what doesn't work, what do we need to improve as, as an industry, but what's really changing now and we need to expand our collaboration is that there are six, at least six new OEMs. There hasn't been a new OEM in the heavy truck industry in decades. And just within the past three years, from top to bottom here is Lion Electric, Tesla, Orange EV, Exos, Neuron, and Nikola are all brand new truck OEMs. So they need to come into the picture. But the big changes at the bottom are that we need the charging system suppliers and the utility companies to join the conversation. We need them at the truck shows, we need them at the TMC events, et cetera. We need to collaborate to make this successful. 
because this is an industry that is very complex and very difficult to understand. Next, please. Uh, changing gears just slightly, I was asked to touch on the subject coming up after us, automated trucks. Uh, we look at this from the lower left, that there are automated technologies that are out there in the industry today. Collision mitigation, um, adaptive cruise control, and other such things that are all leading the way. And the next step in the uh, maturation of these technologies is moving to platooning. And the picture on the right has two trucks in platooning. The two trucks actually communicate electronically. So it's vehicle to vehicle, V to V communications. Kind of ironically, there's a cloud overhead in that picture because the vehicles also communicate to the cloud, not that cloud that's overhead, but the electronic one. And uh, the cloud helps the vehicles know whether the weather conditions are prime for platooning, which they aren't in this case, the road's very wet and there's a big storm, or whether it's even legal in that particular interstate or highway. So. There's a lot going on and we've got a confidence report we put out in 2016 on platooning. Next slide, please. Why is this a big deal? Well, it not only paves the way to further automation, but the fuel savings are enormous. Um, for those of you that are racing fans, think of this as drafting for trucks, that the rear truck gains 10% in fuel economy by being paired up to the front truck electronically. So that the front driver is controlling the accelerator, the shifting, the braking, and all of that's communicated instantaneously to the rear truck. It, the truck responds faster than the driver could ever hope to. Uh, so it's an opportunity for the rear truck, but it's also an opportunity for the front truck. There's about a four and a half percent fuel savings for the front truck by cleaning up the wake behind the first vehicle. Uh, obviously, you can't platoon all the time, so our projections were that fleets can probably gain, on average, about 4% fuel economy. But when you're talking to a major truck fleet, 4% is a huge number. So this is one example of the types of technologies that are now out in the hands of fleets being tested and field tested to move technology forward. Last slide, please. The industry, truck industry, is facing an enormous wave of what's been called disruptions. And we just, I had this slide created before 2020. I just added COVID-19. It was a bigger part to the wave than any of us anticipated. But with autonomous vehicles, driver retirements, electrification, blockchain, artificial intelligence, a whole lot of tech, uh, legislation changes, the truck fleets are, quite frankly, overwhelmed with these technologies coming at them. So we're trying to help people understand, work with folks like NACFI, CalStart, and others. Let's get those surfboards waxed up and let's surf this and make the most we can out of this wave so that we can learn. And if you want to learn with us, follow us on LinkedIn, follow us on Facebook, our websites, nacfi.org, runonless.com. More than anything, I would love for you to send me an email to davidschaller at nacfi.org. I really miss having breakfast, lunch, dinner, a beverage with truck industry, utility industries, DOTs. Uh, this is great. I really appreciate Nebraska's DOT for inviting us. I want to have that next conversation that we just can't have right now. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you so much, David. That was uh, excellent. And thank you for stepping up, uh, leading us off this morning. Um, I'm going to introduce now, I'm going to be introducing uh, Sue Gander. Sue was uh, originally going to be leading us off this morning, but she had some she had some problems, some technical difficulties on her end. Uh, luckily, we got her in. So I'm going to introduce Sue. Uh, Sue serves as the managing director of uh, electrical electric vehicle policy for the electric electrification coalition. Uh, she leads the planning and execution of policy work, accelerating the adoption of plug-in electric vehicles on a mass scale across local, state, and federal levels. Previously, Sue directed the Energy, Infrastructure, and Environment Division at the National Governors Association for over a decade. She spearheaded policy support for the transformation of energy and, trans and transportation sectors. Sue also served at the US EPA as a program manager for the Clean Energy and Environmental Partnership Program and at the Center for Clean Air Policy as manager of government relations and public affairs and as a senior policy analyst where she led initiatives on air quality and climate change. Sue is a brown bear and a Wisconsin Badger, having earned her, her bachelor's in public policy from Brown University and her master's in public policy with a certificate in energy analysis and policy from the University of Wisconsin. 
Uh, the Electrification Coalition is a nonpartisan, not-for-profit organization committed to promoting policies and actions that facilitate the deployment of electric vehicles on a mass scale in order to combat uh, economic, environmental, and national security dangers uh, caused by our dependence on oil. With that, I, uh, I give to you uh, Sue Gander. Sue? Thank you. Um, and I'm not sure, I see my slides up there um, and, and my video is turned on, but I'm just going to start talking. I apologize for the mix up in order here. Um, and, and hopefully um, this all makes sense as I launch into my presentation. I'm going to be talking to you about plugging into a transportation revolution. Really excited to um, talk to the assembled folks um, and looking forward to some of the questions too um, in terms of Nebraska's future on um, um, the opportunities for, for electrification. And Dave gave a great lead into this. I'm going to touch a little bit on the freight opportunities. I think there's some tremendous um, things that we see happening and some great work that NACP is doing um, that uh, we're uh, we're also excited about. So my next slide uh, just gives you a little bit more about Electrification Coalition. I, I think uh, you got the um, the sum, summation there. Um, uh, maybe what I'll point out is that we are um, have really been active at the local level, uh, in particular over the last decade, supporting um, activities such as the American Cities Climate Challenge, um, the Climate Mayor's Bulk Purchasing Cooperative, um, working. Uh, uh, for the last four years on an effort um, to support electrification within the Smart Columbus effort. Um, and then um, piloting and um, deploying uh, accelerator programs to advance EVs within localities across the country. And you've got some logos there from Northern Colorado, where we did our first one, Rochester, Orlando, et cetera. Um, so a lot of great experience that we are now building upon with two new programs. Uh, we have a new state EV policy accelerator. That's something that I came on board about five, almost five months ago now um, to help lead up. And then we also have a freight electrification pilot, which we do hope will inform our state policy work um, and be an opportunity to explore how uh, the medium duty and heavy duty sector, um, so you know, class three and up really um, can, can help play a part in the electrification effort. And, um, and explore a little bit more what kind of policy shifts and changes might be needed to help enable that, that sector to move forward. Our next slide has a little bit more about our motivation from the Electrification Coalition. We are motivated first and foremost by a concern around national and energy security um, and putting that in a little more um, detail, um, as folks probably know, 92% uh, of the U.S. transportation um, sector is powered by oil. Um, our concern is that that is a resource with um, both volatile prices and a real drain on our um, our overall budget. Um, in terms of defending that resource, um, we have a number of retired admirals and generals um, that serve um, on an advisory group um, that that really keep us. Um, focus on that effort and focus on the opportunity that we have, um, which is electrification that, that can really um, address those those concerns. Um, and then I'll note also that, um, you know, that this dependence on oil is also uh, leading to a leading leading to um, greenhouse gas emissions and emissions of other other pollutants that are of concerns to, um, you know, to states and, and countries. Um, writ large. So those are kind of like where we're coming at this from, a little bit different than maybe some other groups you, you might associate with this with this sector. So one of the messages I wanted to share, um, and I'll kind of loop back to this at the end, is that um, this is really a time to accelerate on EVs, um, you know, notwithstanding a lot of the challenges we're facing through the COVID pandemic and, and the associated recession um, and challenges there. But we've seen um, other countries across Europe and, and China um, really um, investing in this sector and making a lot of progress. We do think this is the future of the transportation sector in large part. Um, and the U.S., as you see there in the chart, is, um, you know, really has a huge opportunity to advance here. And, and I will note that just in the last a month or so, um, Germany recently 
announced doubling their tax incentives. So um, not stepping away from that at all. And, um, you know, there are, I think, over 400,000 electric um, transit buses in China. And in the U.S., we haven't topped 1,000 yet. Now, different populations, to be sure, but just to kind of put it in in kind of stark relief there um, in terms of where we're at. And, and it becomes a, a competitiveness issue as well in terms of manufacturing and the opportunities to uh, move forward. So what I do hope you will appreciate is that, and, and Dave got to this a little bit, is there are opportunities in all sectors. The next slide just gives you some nice little photos of um, where we're seeing progress. Um, uh, well over 60 models available and more coming um, every day. I think um, this is across both the light duty um, sector, uh, transit buses, as I mentioned, school buses are now um, also going green. Um, and um, lots of options, um, more and more coming coming online. Um, uh, you know, not every day, but but you know, frequently around um, medium duty and heavy duty um, freight options. Um, really excited um, about one particular sector, which I think is on the next slide, which is um, the move into electrified pickups. So the EV offerings and in, in pickups are picking up. Um, sorry for the pun there. Um, this is a list of where uh, both sort of the, the, the models or the, the manufacturers that are sponsoring um, these models, and uh, it is a little dated. Um, there have been some extensions of these timelines for when they expect to come out. I know the GM F150 um, uh, is now postponed from 2021 to 2022, but um, I believe today um, is when Rivian um, is unveiling their... Um, uh, endurance um, pickup um, from the uh, Lordstown plant in, in Ohio that they took over um, as a former GM plant. So exciting opportunities that just really opens up the, um, uh, you know, opens up the technology to many more people, many more uses. So we're really excited about that. Uh, the, the next slide shows a little bit more uh, around the point um, I made on emissions. Um, this is data that was put together based on um, utility uh, data that the US EPA collects um, and um, tries to give a sense of how emissions from EVs compare to those of, um, of traditionally gasoline powered, um, powered vehicles, um, you know, taking into account that there are still emissions associated with the grid um, you know, more and more states are moving to cleaner and cleaner options, but, you know, but there's, there's still a mix and still a difference. And, um, uh, there's a, you know, uh, a movement to, to continue to, to have, um, cleaner and cleaner generation. Um, what you, um, will see in these maps here is that in 2009 for Nebraska, um, an EV was, um, equivalent to about 39 miles per gallon. Um, a, a, a gasoline vehicle getting 39 miles per gallon in 2016, um, around 59, 51 for all EVs, and then um, uh, for the most efficient vehicles that, that are out there, it would be equivalent about 69. And there's a little bit of a time lag in the data here, so that's why um, you know these are a couple of years behind um, what it is now. But um, just kind of demonstrates that um, they really are um, a good clean option for folks. Uh, the next slide shows a little bit of um, what's happening at the state level. We're seeing a tremendous amount of interest um, in electrification for all the reasons that I mentioned, um, you know, energy security, national security, emissions, economic development. Um, and what the maps and, and the graphs show is that this is happening all over the place. Um, uh, just from, uh, I think the map was a shot from 2019 showing the um, different measures that state legislatures and utility um, utilities had taken. And, you know, some states are more active than others, um, but it's across the board. Um, and it includes, you know, it includes studies and includes regulation, it includes um, efforts around rate design, um, so and, and so on. Um, so it is a variety of measures, um, but definitely states are, are seeing the advantages and trying to move forward um, through the levers that they have um, at, at their disposal. 
one important thing that's also happening as part of that, this is sort of a, a subset of, of those actions that states are, are, are making investments in EVs and in EV um, charging effort infrastructure as well. Um, you'll see on the left um, the, the map of those states that have um, committed a full 15% as they're allowed to do of their VW settlement funds towards uh, EV charging infrastructure. Um, and as I'll say in a moment, there's there's also work um, being done in um, not the light duty sector, but um, the medium duty and heavy duty sector to use the balance of their funds um, to um, support um, vehicle incentives um, for those sectors as well. Um, and there's also a fair amount of um, utility um, funding that's being approved through the state PUCs. Um, so far, 1.5 billion to date and another 1.4 that's pending. It, it did decline a bit in the first quarter of 2020, but um, we expect to see that continued um, given the interest that the um, utility sector has um, uh, in the electric vehicle industry and um, just supporting that um, that sector overall. It, it, it's a way to build their their uh, demand, um, help uh, make investments that make sense for that those businesses. And that's across investor owned utilities as well as public power as well. I think this is more teed into the P, the PUC kind of IOU uh, world, but but definitely happening um, across public power as well. Sue, so this is Courtney. I'm sorry to yeah. jump in. We have a two minute warning for you. OK, awesome. So my my next couple of messages I'll kind of sum up is that we definitely have a long way to go. Um, lots of uh, uh, infrastructure to put in place to meet the projected demand. Um, and what you'll see is just a summary on the next um, slide about the need for strong policy cornerstones. Um, so that um, really is about if you if you're thinking about how to move forward on um, I'll just say ZEV, which is zero emission vehicles. Um, it's really about charging infrastructure, it's financing, it's funding, it's education and outreach, um, it's fleet electrification, and all of those things are really important to think through in support of forward movement um, alongside considerations of, of equity and access and, and VMT reductions and efficiency. Um, the Nebraska EV market, um, and hopefully you all will get these slides after, um, you know, it's still growing, um, you know, understandably uh, in terms of um, where some of the um, the use cases work best, um, but this shows where things are in Nebraska now. Um, the next slide shows where the charging infrastructure is. Um, it's really that highway corridor, um, which makes sense and actually plays into the freight play, I think, quite a bit. Um, putting this in context, you'll see where Nebraska is in terms of sales compared to other Midwest states um, or, or central states, um, and you know. Uh, other states um, moving forward in in um, in some other directions. I think some opportunities for Nebraska to consider, you know, what makes sense in terms of their strategy. Putting it in context a little bit more is on the next slide. I think it's the chart up above that really spoke to me um, as much as the table comparing yourself to kind of your neighbors. Um, there is. Um, there's just a lot of clustering, you know, on the left side, you've got California, Oregon, Washington out in front, but you know, everyone else is kind of in the, kind of in the same uh, boat, if you will. Um, there are a lot of opportunities. As I mentioned, we, um, you can probably just skip through the next few slides. We did some calculations of um, what it would look like if Nebraska went all the way to electrification for light duty, for school buses, for transit. And I'll just end on my last slide, which is, I hope a voice of, of optimism and encouragement um, is that we've seen these kind of transformations of the technology happen rapidly in the past. Um, in the early 1900s, there was a shift from horse and buggy uh, to um, to vehicles, and we think the next wave of this, and would love it if Nebraska uh, moves in this direction, is towards electrification. So, love to answer any questions that I had to skim through that a bit. But thanks for the opportunity to uh, to be with you today. Excellent. Thank you so much, Susan. Uh, great presentation. I know we had to we had to skip through it there a little bit at the end. Uh, hopefully, we can revisit that a little bit uh, no with, some of the, with some of the discussion on the back end. Uh, so next, I'd like to uh, I'd like to get to uh, Ben Holland. Ben Holland is with the uh, Rocky Mountain Institute RMI. He's a senior associate there on their team in Boulder, 
Colorado, where he's working to advance urban design and land use solutions that will facilitate a global transition from personally owned vehicles to electric and autonomous mobility services. Uh, ben works directly with RMI, the Rocky Mountain Institute's uh, partners in Boulder there, as well as a wide range of community and industry stakeholders. He previously managed Project Get Ready, a multi-city collaborative focused uh, on electric vehicle policy and infrastructure solutions. Uh, before our RMI, Ben was the Director of Deployment Policy and Strategy at Securing America's Future Energy, SAFE, uh, where he led efforts to advance electric vehicle adoption in the organization's deployment communities. Uh, please welcome Ben Holland. Ben? Thank you. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Great. Great. Well, thanks for the opportunity to speak with you about RMI's work. Um, so my presentation is really focused on looking at the um, sort of the, the current state of emissions reduction strategies across the U.S. Um, RMI has been for about over 35 years has been focused on sort of business-led, uh, market-driven solutions to climate change and um, uh, energy security. Um, and we the way we've done that work over the last uh, last few years, especially on the transportation side of things, has really been focused on vehicle electrification, and we continue to do a great deal of work in vehicle electrification. However, um, we've started to look at what is the real, what 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 needs to get done to reduce emissions to a level that we need to see um, going forward. And we're kind of like many other environmental organizations, we're looking to the IPCC that set the goal of limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius by 2030. So we asked ourselves, um, what would it take for the vehicle sector or the transportation sector to, uh, to reduce its share of emissions? And basically we're looking at reducing um, each sector, whether it's buildings, electricity, industry, or transportation, I believe by 55% by 2030. So um, we looked at a number of different scenarios for getting there. Um, next slide, please. So before I jump jump into those scenarios, um, just wanted to give a quick overview of where we are with the transportation sector. I think this was, I think Sue had this on her slide, but transportation is the number one contributor to carbon emissions in the country um, and recently overtook other sectors uh, at, as the single largest contributor. That may change this year, given the um, drops in uh, traffic volume and vehicle usage, but um, we expect it over, term, over, over time to continue taking the lion's share of um, carbon emissions. And, um, and a big part of that is, and I'll get into this in a little bit, but a big part of that is um, an increase in vehicle miles traveled across the country, uh, which has overtaken or continues to offset the advancements of um, vehicle efficiency and electric vehicle adoption. The next slide, please. So kind of going through these different scenarios, we, um, we first, and this slide's a bit confusing, and I apologize, but we wanted to look at what was the potential of just getting there from purely from electrification um, of various sec various segments of the, the automobile market. We, if you look over to all the way to the right, um, option four, we first looked at doing it just by electrifying fleets. And the reason being there is that fleets tend to have the most miles. They also, in having the most miles, are the most economically viable for electrification because, of course, the, the operating cost of electric vehicles is so low that um, if you are putting more miles on a vehicle, it makes more sense. You can pay back the, the, the upfront cost of the vehicle faster. Um, However, in looking at the fleet market, we realized that um, we we're only going to get um, just a little bit of carbon emissions reduction potential there. And we also looked at the top 10, um, the top mileage vehicles, as well as kind of the dirtiest vehicles, if you will. And, and we, there's certainly opportunity there as well, but we basically landed on um, a goal of 50 million EVs on the road by 2030. And in Doing so, we would also need a 30% reduction in vehicle miles traveled. So next slide, and I'll kind of give a, a visualization of what that would look like from an EV standpoint. So we wanted to kind of visualize what each state would have in 2030 if it was meeting that goal of 50 million EVs. Um, 
by 2030. And I think in Nebraska here, we have uh, about 304,000 EVs on the road in 2030. So I, I think Sue showed there's about 2,000, some 2,500 um, currently. So you need a very ambitious, uh, aggressive uptake of electric vehicles, again, from a climate standpoint, um, to get to those those goals. And I, I should say that, you know, there's certainly, as Electrification Coalition is, has pointed out many times and has done tremendous amount of work in this space, there's, there's always that uh, energy security perspective or um, justification for electrification. But, um, you know, this is uh, this not only requires a great deal of uptake in the vehicles, but a significant amount of uh, EVSE or charging station deployment across the country. Um, so we're estimating that um, you need about 36,000 DC fast chargers in California alone. Um, I think that we are estimating over 5 million charging stations nationwide by 2030 would be required. Um, but let's get back uh, to the next slide and, and to sort of like what it means from an uptake standpoint. So to hit the mark in 2030 for 50 million EVs, we estimate that you need about a 39% year over year growth rate in a vehicle adoption. And this was uh, this analysis was done a few months ago before the current state that we're in right now, but we figured if, if you could sustain a 39% year over year growth rate, you would be able to get to 50 million by 2030. However, we also sort of baked in this, um, this alternative scenario that if there was a lag in adoption for some reason, uh, let's call it like a five year lag, um, you would need an extremely aggressive uptake in electric vehicles, so aggressive that you would need to sell more EVs in 2030 or 2029 than we sell um, just across the board. So I think we, we sell about 17 million cars a year in the US. Um, you would need about 19 million EVs um, in 2029 to get there. And of course, this is like these these numbers are are very conversational, but sort of um, getting to getting to the point that this is a significant uh, um, kind of uphill battle that we have ahead of us, and we and we need to approach it aggressively, but also trying to kind of uh, to instill a bit of a uh, practicality in all of this. Next slide, please. So I apologize for the typo and the, the title there, but um, I wanted to compare this to a couple of the um, the projections that we see in the marketplace now. So. Bloomberg New Energy Finance is probably the most uh, pointed to um, as far as new energy is in, in electric vehicles, the most uh, referenced um, market analyst organization out there. Um, and also tends to be the most optimistic and they're calling for about 16 million on the road by 2030 and the Energy Information Administration is estimating about 7 million. Next slide, please. Um, you know, and, I'm, and I should say again, I'm not trying to paint a grim picture of what the, the reality is. It's more so that we are trying to raise the kind of the profile or raise awareness around a need for a comprehensive approach to uh, transportation climate strategies. And this came out of, uh, in, in large part, was influenced by uh, California Air Resources Board, which recently found that. Um, even under the most ambitious scenarios for electric vehicle adoption, they would fall very short of their transportation climate emissions uh, goals. Um, they called initially in the 2018 progress report, they called for a 25% reduction in VMT. Um, of course, going back to our analysis, we're saying it's about 30%. Um, I think they have since then uh, revised that to about 15%. But the point being that um, there needs to be a a, a more co a comprehensive strategy for addressing this sector. Next slide, please. I wanted to kind of give a just just reference a few assumptions in the space when it comes to VMT re reduction. Um, there has long been, especially in the environmental community, um, in the past few years, a um, a sense that reducing vehicle use or getting people out of their vehicles is uh, simply too difficult of a task. And if you look at the sort of the way that land use affects the transportation sector, there's even more so of a, a, I guess, a skepticism that we can affect that space. We are starting to question that skepticism 
in looking at the progress that some cities like Seattle have made in shifting people to public transit. Um, it, Seattle, Portland, and Minneapolis uh, revising their land development codes to incentivize more walkability, more density around um, uh, employment centers and transit corridors. And we, along with some other environmental organizations like NRDC, WRI, and others, are trying to kind of build this coalition of um, of environmental organizations that are dedicated to to um, addressing sort of the the non electric vehicle strategies related to transportation. Um, next slide. And this will be my final slide, and this is a bit dated, but it's kind of giving you an overview of what we've been up to and what we'll be doing going forward. Um, this first phase, we're still sort of in this, and we've had a number of different workshops and conferences that we've been presenting at and kind of building this coalition of nonprofits that I mentioned, really aimed at um, BMT reduction as a, as a critical strategy for improving transportation emissions or reducing transportation emissions. Um, in the phase two that we're getting getting ready to move into, one of the, one of the big um, issues that we identified recently is that despite transportation being the largest contributor to carbon emissions, for most cities across the US, and despite the fact that most cities across the US have, or many cities, I should say, have um, very ambitious climate action plans, um, very few, and in fact, I think it's less than 10 cities actually have a goal for reducing vehicle miles traveled, um, and even fewer have made progress toward reducing vehicle miles traveled. And a big problem there is that they lack um, a reliable source of information and data on where their trans transportation emissions are headed. Um, the New York Times recently had a great piece showing that the vast majority of cities across the US are seeing an uptick in transportation emissions. The one that really stood out to, for me is Portland, which has done a significant amount of work around transit and vehicle electrification, and their emissions are continuing to climb. And uh, we're starting to, to realize through a series of interviews with cities and Kind of ramping up this initiative that there's a great deal of work to be done to improve the processes um, and the data collection around around uh, transportation emissions. So we'll be working on that over the next few months and then ultimately. Looking to identify a number of policies <clears throat> that are proven to reduce vehicle emissions and transportation emissions through a focus on vehicle miles traveled. And again, um, continuing to do a great deal of work around vehicle electrification. Um, we're also doing extensive amount of work around bus electrification for different cities and transit agencies around the country. So really kind of this holistic approach to reducing transportation emissions. Um, so I'll leave it at that and uh, looking forward to questions. Ben, excellent presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, very good job. So uh, what I'd like to do at this point in time is I'd like to um, take a Take a little bit of a pause here uh, from, from the presentations. I'd, I'd like to give an opportunity to uh, uh, facilitate some discussion, ask some questions of our, of our first three panelists this morning, Sue, David, and Ben. Um, and I'd like to give uh, Courtney Ehrlichman, uh, who I introduced before, uh, she's, a, she's an expert and a leader in, in, in transportation technology. I'd like to give her the, the first crack at, at asking some questions of our, of our distinguished uh, guests this morning. So Courtney, do you have any questions for our, our panelists? I sure do. Thank you very much. Those are great presentations, David, Sue, and Ben. Thank you very much for your insights. I think what I'm really interested in hearing more about and hoping that the, the stakeholders here and participants might be interested in hearing more about is sort of diving deeper in into the data that you've presented and tying it into some relevance with Nebraska DOT. So for example, um, you know, the outlook, what I'm getting, what I'm gathering is the outlook is not so good. Uh, we need to reduce BMTs in Nebraska, um, but we also have this messy middle aspect um, if we're going to accomplish the 340,000 EVs. So how can Nebraska sort of navigate both of those threads at the same time? And, you know, what are the data sets specifically, Dave, David, that you mentioned? that NDOT can tap into. So I think there's a, overall, there's some data sets that I wanna dive into and a, a bigger conversation about um, this VMT versus EV and then tying into 
freight and also individual vehicle miles. I know there was a study that just dropped on the 23rd, two days ago, that was outlining, um, you know, how much does owning an EV actually save an individual? And so that we're talking about, you know, economic incentives. And in, in Nebraska, it's 15 cents a kilowatt hour. Um, and it's, it's actually, not, there's not a lot of cost savings for individuals over the lifetime or 15 years of owning an EV, something along the line of $4,000 versus $12,000 in California. So we have this tension uh, and I think Ben spoke to that, but what are some scenarios that you might recommend from the freight perspective that would be specific to Nebraska and some data sets that you could provide? And Sue, you were talking about these four cornerstones of policy. I'd love to hear more about you know, how could Nebraska really position and do some scenario based planning? I mean, the, I think what's really incredible about this long range transportation plan Nebraska is working on is it's it's scenario based. So if any of you want to take that and run with it, please do. Let's start with Dave. Okay. <laughs> uh, that was one heck of a long <laughs> question. Uh, the, I think you asked at the beginning of that about the data sets and whatnot. What I was offering up is that we had 10 vehicles, 10 trucks that were part of run on less regional operating in all different parts of the country. There wasn't one in Nebraska, I'm sorry, but there was run, one running out of Dallas. So uh, that data so that people can understand what the life of a day in a life of a truck is is available to people now. So as they're doing studies and want to understand what what's a good model look like, we've made that information available to people. So there are some very different ways trucks are used. Our, our report that we released last week covers that some uh, are essentially running Pony Express now where one driver will run out half a day's worth of driving, swap trailers with a teammate headed to another city and come back. So they're going as far as they can in one day without needing to stay overnight anywhere. Um, that's a value to the environment because that means nobody's sleeping in the truck. The truck's not idling. It doesn't need some auxiliary power source. It's at home in the yard and shut off when it's not running. That's an advantage. Um, so so what could Nebraska DOT, for example, like what does Nebraska DOT need to be thinking about to enhance that? Um, are there, what are other DOTs doing to, to make that happen? And maybe you can talk a little bit more about where that was deployed and, and what sort of fostered that. Okay, for uh, yeah. the suggestion is the DOTs off the top of my head. Uh, number one, adequate parking facilities. Drivers want to drive as much as they can in a day. They get paid by the mile. The more miles they go, the more they get paid. But the truck parking shortage was so severe prior to COVID hitting that drivers were losing at least an hour of driving time every day because they were getting off and looking for parking spots. And some of the state DOTs have worked together to set up electronic uh, counting systems so that drivers know how many parking spots are available at locations up ahead so they can plan their driving to go as far as they can in a day and know they've got a place to stop. Um, electrification is just not running electric trucks, that uh, a lot of trucks have electric air conditioning systems and whatnot on them. If there could be um, shore power locations in um, rest areas and other places so that they can plug in at night or during the day when they're stopped, rather than running their great big 15 liter diesel engine, uh, plug in and run the air conditioning in their refrigerator off of a shore power system. So there are definitely things that the DOT can do, and I would be glad to be involved in further conversations along those lines. Great. Um, have you worked with Nebraska DOT in any of their efforts before with your organization? I have not had the privilege, and I really appreciate the chance to speak here today so that we can engage further in the future. Okay, cool. Uh, thank you. So, Sue, um, let's talk about the uh, more use cases and maybe some what other DOTs are doing that you're seeing that are that is notable in terms of policy. Sure. 
Sure. Right. Thanks. And, and, and maybe I'll just um, start with a comment on the, the study that you mentioned that I think came out in Jewel, um, J-O-U-L-E, um, journal. Um, I hadn't, I didn't get a chance to look at it for Nebraska, but, um, you know, I'd say one thing to take into account there would be, um, if the savings are, are 4,000, what's the added cost of having, uh, of buying a, a EV versus, a you know, an equivalent gasoline vehicle and, and kind of considering like it, you know, that stream of savings is going to be over time. So obviously that's, you know, a first cost barrier issue, but, um, you know, there, there still be, there still could be scenarios, um, that, that are, that make sense for, um, for drivers, um, you know, to make those kind of, um, kinds of choices. Um, I, I, I think what I'd say is that I, you know, it's, I would like to point out that Nebraska has, um, a few really, um, important and meaningful things, um, I believe still on the books, if you will, um, to bro- provide incentives for, um, both EV and EVSE purchases. There's some loan programs. There's a rebate program that the um, Omaha Public Power District um, has in place, um, something through the Nebraska Public Power District as well. Um, those incentives are really critical. It's it, it's tough. It's always tough to find money to make those kinds of investments, but um, those are really meaningful. Um, I think, you know, there's opportunities for the DOT itself to think about its fleet of vehicles and um, how electrifying um, its own fleet. Um, and I'm not familiar enough with, you know, how, how it, it's set up, but most DOTs have a pretty, um, pretty large portion of the state fleet overall. Um, so that's something to look at a little more in detail. Um, certainly DOTs are really critical for thinking through um, EV corridors, um, thinking about signage issues so that folks know where um, charging infrastructure is available. Um, lots of great work being done at, at DOTs across the, the country on that. Um, some DOTs are, are um, you know, being a little more expansive um, in, their, in their work and kind of leading the, the, um, a broader multi-agency effort. Um, I know that's happening in, in North Carolina. We work closely with them. Um, I think the DOT in Colorado has a um, pretty engaged um, uh, set of activities they do with other agencies. So I guess, you know, my my message for Nebraska DOT is um, if you're not already connected to your um, kind of sister and brother agencies um, that are interested in this topic through energy, environment, economic development, um, that's a really great opportunity to kind of combine forces uh, and, you know, kind of see what, what jointly can be done. Um, and I'd say keep an eye out for um, the next round of, of infrastructure investments at the federal level. Um, it's it's going to be a long slog, um, uh, so I, I'm not predicting um, much this year, but um, there's a big push federally to try and enhance investments um, through different grant programs um, that many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with um, that are run through both the federal DOT and other agencies. Um, so there could be other opportunities to for instance, tap in more to the Lono funding that I know um, is already supporting some electric bus conversion um, Great. there in Nebraska. So, you know, definitely some opportunities. Thanks, Sue. Um, I want to just make sure we have some time for Ben to give some more feedback as well. Um, I, I think your presentation is really interesting because you're talking about that tension between, you know, this dramatic uh, increase that's needed in EVs, and I think the other two presentations were talking about, you know, the the all the work that needs to go in to make that happen, and that there's this also this alternative lever of reduction in VMT. So, you know, can you talk a little bit about how both of these things can tie into, you know, future resiliency efforts? I think that might be really relevant to Nebraska DOT, who just this last year experienced a tremendous amount of flooding and we're actually going to be having a presentation next week um, tying into resiliency but i mean just for you know nebraska dot to be thinking about both of these things at the same time uh, that might be a great approach for you to to speak to okay yeah so on the electrific- electrification side um i mean when i think about resiliency that there's a number of different angles to approach it from but um in, in 
Electrification Coalition has also been really great about this, about sort of showcasing this, but uh, vehicle electrification is probably the most, uh, it's, it's, it's a very sort of resilient uh, transportation solution in the fact that it's, it's secure against uh, oil market um, electricity rates do not swing the way that uh, oil rate oil prices do. So um, electric vehicle owners are a bit sheltered from that. Um, from when it comes to sort of environmental or um, I don't know uh, disasters and um, other kind of unforeseen events with blackouts and things of that nature. Um, there's a great deal of, I think there's a great deal of exciting developments happening in the space of vehicle to grid technology, um, battery storage technology, and ultimately the ability to sort of um, uh, basically island one's oneself off of the, the electric electricity grid once we get to a point where uh, battery storage systems are are cheap enough to do so. Um, I think that there, it's, there's a fair, a fair amount of independence uh, that one can have in owning an electric vehicle. Um, from a VNT perspective, or just kind of mode shift perspective, um, there is a sort of inherent fragility, I think, to the, the, the conventional way that we are funding our transportation systems uh, and probably a need, and I'm, I'm getting into territory that I must admit that I, <laughs> I'm not an expert on, especially when it comes to state DOTs or highway um, investments, but there's a kind of a growing conventional wisdom that um, some of the, the highway funding, some of that funding may be better suited toward ma maintenance and repair versus expansions and potentially investing in um, managed lanes, transit priority lanes, um, and sort of non-motorized uh, vehicle, non-motorized transportation infrastructure. Sort of the way we've been talking about it, RMI, as far as you know, bike infrastructure, pedestrian infrastructure, the kind of urbanist um, infrastructure that you know, that uh, a lot of people in the in the, the urban planning world have been promoting recently has lo for a long time been treated as these precious um, solutions or these they're not not scalable or technology driven solutions. And we're realizing that 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 may be the case, but um, they're absolutely vital to the future of cities and much of I should just close by saying that I think that much of the work that we're looking at um, is largely driven through the city context and maybe to some degree the metropolitan planning organizations. But when we talk about land use and um, urban design and such transportation investments, um, there's a there's the, the burden probably lies on the, the city shoulders more than the states. Great. Okay, that makes sense. Um, thank you for that. I want to also just I just notice there's some questions in the chat box from Blake Hansen. Blake, are yeah, you able? Uh, Courtney, uh, yeah. real quick. Uh, in the interest of time, I think I'd like to get on to the next uh, the next group of panelists, and then what we can do is uh, on the back end, if we've got time, we can we can get into some of these questions. I see him. I see him there. Blake's one. I've got another one as well. And uh, uh, but I'd like to uh, be respectful of everybody's time. So I'd like to get the next group of panelists going, and then at the end, maybe you know we can we can get some of these questions answered, even if it maybe bleeds into the, to, to the noon hour a little bit. But um, if it's if it's all right, I'd like to get uh, I'd like to kind of plot ahead. But I'd like to thank the panelists as well. Excellent job answering Courtney's questions. Courtney asked some tough ones there. Uh, she's pulling out uh, studies that were done two days ago. I mean, how's that for being on the cutting edge and being a forefront of, of the you know of the industry, a leader in the industry? Um, very, very, very good questions, Courtney. Thank you. Um, and thank you again for, uh, for our, our three panelists here in the 10 o'clock hour. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Dan Piakowski. Dan is a, uh, he's an assistant professor and he's a, a Le Leicester Hyde professor uh, of community and regional planning at the University of Nebraska. Uh, he's a fellow at the Center for Great Plains Studies and affiliate faculty the Nebraska Transportation Center. He teaches at both the graduate undergraduate levels in transportation planning, land use, urban design, and research methods. Uh, his research interests include active transportation, social justice, and technology at the intersection of urban design and planning. 
Uh, Dan works a lot with the NDOT, does a lot of research uh, projects for us. Uh, some of his recent works include uh, the interaction between carrots and sticks in travel behavior decisions, uh, social media tools and equitable community engagement, and the phenomenon of scofflaw bicycling. Uh, why bicyclists break the rules of the road and, uh, and why drivers respond in aggressive ways to bicyclists. Um, uh, as a bicyclist who breaks the law of the road, I, I just go ahead and offer a hypothesis being uh, no cop, no stop. Uh, so uh, he's currently working on three NDOT funded projects, uh, preparing for a driverless future, uh, the economic impacts of bicycle tourism in Nebraska, and using big data to understand bicycling behavior. Uh, he earned his PhD in design and planning from the University of Colorado Denver, uh, where he was an NSF IGERT fellow in sustainable urban infrastructure. And he has a master's of urban and environmental planning, uh, as well as a bachelor's in English from both Arizona State, uh, both of which are from Arizona State University. Yeah, he's the Sun Devil. Uh, so please welcome Dan Piakowski. Dan. Well, hey, everybody. Um, thanks, Curtis, for the introduction. Um, just uh, make sure you can hear me. Can you hear me okay? Yes, Dan, I can hear you. Great. Okay, um, so I, my presentation today is, is, is titled Smart Cities for the Rest of Us, and it's specifically about what autonomous technology, autonomous vehicle technology could mean for Nebraska's transportation future. I titled it this because, as many of you I think are aware, there's, there's a real a, a lack of a Nebraska-specific conversation about what autonomous technologies could mean for our state and our communities within our state. So I'll talk about that and kind of um, put together some of the literature, uh, then I'll also talk about some of the implications of recent events of the uh, social justice movement that we're seeing a resurgence in and also COVID-19. And then I'll kind of close this presentation by talking about planning in the face of really unprecedented uncertainty. Next slide, please. So what could AV tech mean for quote unquote, the rest of us, you know, all of us in flyover country or, or what have you? Well, you know, as you know, many of you are aware that the conversation around AVs is very much an urban centric conversation. And in Nebraska, we spend a lot of time talking about rural issues in addition to rural issues. And, and sometimes, you know, versus rural issues or rural versus urban issues. But I, I would encourage everyone to think more about travel within a community versus regional travel. Um, across communities, uh, across the state, across the country. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about two, two trends that I, I think might end up competing with each other given um, AV technologies, which is trucking and delivery and then also personal travel. And this work is part of a larger project that I'm, I'm working with NDOT on currently called Preparing for a Driverless Future. And one part of that project I'm, I'm excited about is literally two days ago, I got data back from a statewide survey asking Nebraska residents what they thought of their transportation future. So I'll close with a couple statistics from that. Next slide. Okay. Um, for those of you who are not up on the conversation on AVs, the, the potential benefits are wide ranging and, um, you know, we'll see if they, they, they bear out given that the technology really isn't there yet. But, you know, as, as most of you probably do know the, the benefits uh, involve increased speed, increased efficiency, you know, that ability to platoon and all those great things. Uh, but then also increased safety, increased safety between vehicles, but also increased safety uh, between vehicles and pedestrians and cyclists. And then the other thing is, is travel time. When we're talking about efficiency, you know, we're reducing travel time, but we can no longer ideally, you know, in given the possibility of AVs, we no longer have to think about travel time as a negative. You can start, th start thinking of it as time to do other things, if it's working or if it's just taking a nap or something. Um, put all of those together and, you know, wrap them up and consider them in the potential of being a shared system. That's when cities could conceivably start thinking about rethinking some street space. If these technologies are efficient, if these technologies are, um, you know, shared, so they're not going to use parking spaces, we can start dedicating lanes to active transportation. We can start dedicating parking space to sort of higher uses, to mixed use development, to small business growth. So that's sort of the, the, the wide ranging um, array of benefits. Next slide, please. Now, the, the big problem with those uh, benefits is, you know, they, they really depend on, on a number of assumptions. Um, and one of the assumptions that they depend on is sharing, obviously, but they also depend on the fact that VMT isn't going to, to increase dramatically. And 
really, if you take nothing else from my presentation today, I hope you take from this presentation that I'm extremely worried about increases in VMT across all forms of transportation uh, given autonomous vehicles. So this slide is taken from a, a presentation by a friend of mine at UC Davis who they wanted to see what would happen if people were given an autonomous vehicle, how it would change their vehicle miles traveled. And they had a, a really ingenious low tech solution. They just gave people a car with a chauffeur and they just measured VMT changes. They found in this study an 83% increase in vehicle miles traveled uh, when people were given sort of simulated autonomous vehicle. And this is in line with every other study that I've seen that's predicting anywhere from 20 to 80% increases in VMT in a quote unquote autonomous future. Next slide, please. So there's a number of this, there's this constellation of concerns that I have from looking at the literature and looking at the research out there. And it all centers around increasing vehicle miles traveled and, you know, sort of an increase in the trajectory of what is currently an already unsustainable system. So we're looking at the potential for um, increases in, in trucking, both locally and regionally. You know, locally, we're looking at increases in delivery vehicles. Um, you know, we're looking at regional trucking increases in addition to those already predicted. Um, and we've seen that happen given the pandemic. We've got the sort of local and regional increases in personal vehicle use and personal vehicle, personal VMT. Locally, that's uh, just adding trips to the grocery store and things like that. But regionally, you know, that's things like uh, the potential increase in super commuting, if you can get a few extra hours of sleep on your way to Kansas City to work or something like that. But also, you know, people traveling for recreational purposes. You know, plane travel is, is uh, kind of a big question mark right now, given the pandemic. And I think uh, if the technology were there, a lot of people would be happy to uh, load the family up in a car and just set it on autopilot and wake up in the Rocky Mountains. So these are things to be considering. The other thing is now looking at this bubble for sharing. Depending on um, you know, the, the potential for AVs depends on whether or not they're shared and, you know, the potential for them to impact changes within cities depends on them being shared. And that's really only something that can happen in urban population centers, large urban population centers, you know, smaller than around 200,000 people. We're, we're looking at some problems, um, suburban areas in larger cities. We're looking at problems with sharing. And then also it remains to be seen what happens with ride sharing services um, sort of, you know, during the, the pandemic um, situation. Then to kind of to wrap all of this up, there's also these equity concerns that, you know, we currently have a number of equity concerns in our, our transportation system around you know, um, supporting demand for, for vehicle miles traveled, for, for vehicle travel. And that would likely get worse in an autonomous world. Um, first, there's the cost of the system. You know, I think one thing is for certain, it's probably gonna cost more than transit. Um, what it looks like if it's shared versus people buying their own cars, that's gonna be a big question mark. But then there's design issues around the technology itself. Uh, the designers are, you know, they approximate the people in this, this picture on the, on the equity side or in the equity circle. Um, you know, young urban professionals, um, typically well off, you know, we're not, they're not thinking, or I haven't seen the designs for aging populations or for disabled populations. My concern is, is those communities are gonna be really left out. Next slide, please. Okay, so I've, I've mentioned this a little bit already, but um, you know, if we're looking at an autonomous future, that means really doubling down on our current auto-based infrastructure. It means understanding and, and recognizing the fact that our, our history of auto infrastructure is one of sort of creating and exacerbating social injustices in our um, country. You know, there's access and environmental equity issues that come from where where highways are placed and how people can get the products they need. But there's also enforcement enforcement inequities, and all of these things are occurring on systems that we as transportation professionals create and we as transportation professionals plan for and, and maintain. So I think that planning to accommodate increasing vehicle miles traveled, specifically with regard to an, an autonomous future, means likely making these problems worse. So that's something to keep in mind. Next slide, please. Okay, um, but then we can kind of, uh, you know, look at some, some other possibilities when we think about um, things that we can learn from the, the pandemic right now and some of the closures that happened uh, with the pandemic. You know, I really like this, uh, this quote because it's funny, given a relatively serious presentation, uh, but it illustrates a really important point that, you know, as people are trying to social distance and they're working from home and things like that, they still are needing to get out and be active. And we've seen huge increases in walking and bicycling alongside decreases in vehicle miles traveled. 
Um, granted, a lot of these v VMT decreases are associated with people losing their jobs, and this is this is bad. Um, that's you know unmistakably bad. But for those people who can work remotely, that's a good thing, and we should be promoting that, and we should be considering that moving forward. And you know, I think our cities have already realized that. Hey, look, we don't necessarily need driverless technologies to have to be able to repurpose street space. You know, we can go ahead and do that when we need to um, to promote business growth, to promote walking and bicycling and healthy behaviors. So these are a few takeaways. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. So what does uh, all of this mean for Nebraska? You know, I think we've got two related but distinct issues here. Um, if we're looking at autonomous technology and what it means for increasing vehicle miles traveled, uh, we're looking at within cities and towns of any size, remember that. Um, we're looking at making decisions about are, is street space for cars or is street space for people? And what are the implications of that for equity, for our economy, for our sustainability? And then when we're looking at rural roads and highways, there's the um, likely the competition that's going to evolve with freight versus personal travel. You know, adding lanes to I-80 is never going to be a reality given our current economic conditions. Um, so, you know, we've got sort of a, a you know, a fixed capacity uh, with increases in VMT for both those sectors. So I think some hard decisions are going to have to be made there. Okay, um, next slide, please. All right, um, I, as I promised at the beginning of this presentation, some initial findings from this statewide survey um, from that NDOT has sponsored, asking Nebraskans about what they expect for their transportation future. Two takeaways, I think, for, for long range planning efforts. The first is, 89% of the people surveyed in, in this survey, and this was, uh, we actually oversampled in rural areas, so we had a, a population that represented the entire state. 89% of people agree that they want to see investments in transportation that promote economic development. 83% of people agree that they want to see investments in environmentally sustainable transportation options. I think this is a great sign moving forward because that's a Venn diagram with a ton of overlap. And I think that we can realize a lot of important goals while also sort of meeting the needs and the expectations of Nebraskans. Uh, last slide, please. Okay, um, you know, once again, we don't actually know if or when this technology is going to, to become available. You know, the estimates vary, but assuming it does, I think it's really helpful for us to think about AV Tech as a likely VMT force multiplier. And, and I think that that's a, that's kind of a terrifying thought given, uh, you know, the economic conditions that we're experiencing right now and, and other, other problems going on. That said, I think in the face of really not knowing what to do about the way that this technology could uh, dramatically imp increase travel demand, I think this is a leverage point to really think in a visionary way about what transportation planning is for, you know, for economic develop development, for sustainability goals, um, and kind of how we can think long term about meeting those needs and also taking into account how to address social justice issues, taking into account how to be resilient to future shocks such as the, the pandemic, but also floods and those sorts of things. So thanks everyone for your time. And uh, that's all I have to say. And I'm sorry, I can't seal your faces in person. Dan, excellent presentation. A lot of good stuff to think about. And I really appreciate how it was, you know, you really did Nebraska is that uh, for us, because a lot of that topic is very, very urban centric. And, uh, and we've got a, we've got some, we've got a little bit of some rural uh, here in Nebraska. So a little bit. So thank you very much. So. Uh, with that, uh, Justin Robbins is going to be up next. Justin uh, is a mobility technology planner with HDR, uh, working on the planning and implementation of technology projects throughout North America, ranging from projects to a model uh, autonomous transit to assessing the land use impacts of new mobility. Uh, his experience in urban design and planning allow for a broader view of the issues associated with new mobility, along with the potential to harness its benefits to promote positive changes for our society and the places that we build. Uh, Justin is an Ohio State Buckeye. Having earned both his bachelor's and his master's uh, uh, from Ohio State, bachelor's in architecture and his master's in city and regional planning. Uh, and he is also an adjunct faculty member uh, at the planning school there. So uh, please welcome Justin. Justin, you there? I am, I am here. Can you uh, see my video and hear my voice? I can see you and I can hear you. Excellent. I uh, definitely appreciate the opportunity. I'm I'm broadcasting live from uh, the great state of Ohio and, and my attic. So it's either you, you get to see the attic as my background and you get to hear about the kids in the background. So I'm really excited to be able to present today. And, and my background, as uh, Curtis had mentioned, is uh, planning. And really what I want to do is talk about some of the, the city implications and some of the land use implications that are typically found with 
um, how you consider um, some of these advances in mobility. So if we want to go to the next slide, and I think we can probably skip over this one too, because this is, oh, good. This is a good one. Uh, so Wright's law uh, states that it was it was Theodore Wright that, that um, he's an aeronautical engineer, noticed this in about 1930, and noticed that for every cumulative doubling in the number of airplanes produced, manufacturers realized a consistent cost decline in percentage terms. And really what that means is the better we are at making things, the more we make, and the more we make, the cost comes down. And this has been something that has been, I'm sure people are familiar with Moore's Law. This is actually a lot more accurate than Moore's Law. Moore's Law applies specifically to transistors and the density on a chip, but this is something that holds true for a lot of different industries. Something holds true for things like DNA sequencing. Cost $7 billion for the first one, now you can get one done for $100. Uh, processor speed, memory, data transmission, a lot of industries are really guided by this kind of exponential growth that you see in technologies. And another really good one to, to mention is um, battery technology and, and energy storage. So in uh, 2010, it was approximately $1,100 per kilowatt hour. Uh, a battery storage, and now they're estimating around 2023, you're gonna hit about $100 per kilowatt hour. So this is a really good example of, of how the cost of these technologies are declining and our ability to actually manufacture these are, are uh, continuing to, to um, increase. Next slide, please. So in 1903, uh, we discovered flight, powered flight with a Wright Flyer. And then in the course of the continuing 42 years, if we skip ahead, using uh, slide rules, not computers, uh, we were able to break the sound barrier. So this is the Bell X1, an enormous amount of progress that was done in a pretty short amount of time, um, again, using manual calculations. And this is the, the lens that we need to see uh, the continuing advance of these technologies. And these are broadly focused around autonomous technologies, connected technologies, electric and shared technologies. Next slide, please. So, this really describes exponential growth and any time period that you have if you can double what you're doing you're in exponential growth territory the question is how quickly that happens and at what point that exponential growth tapers off this is something that's really difficult for people for the human mind to understand there's not a lot of examples in nature where exponential growth happens like this and it's really something that you can look at technology and, and we see things linearly we look backwards um, in our past to try and understand how they're going to happen in the future but that's not really the way that, that technology increases at a point where we're looking at autonomous and connected technology, and we're kind of that area of disappointment, I would say, where in 2016, 2017, people were really excited about it. We see that there's doesn't seem to be, you know, overtaking the system right now. Uh, but that's because primarily these technologies are developing on an exponential scale and not linearly. And you can see how linear develops versus exponential. And once that line crosses, that's when we hit the knee of the curve and things kind of get crazy. Next slide, please. I want to show, for example, uh, company, and this is just one of the, the leaders in autonomous technology right now. This is Waymo, um, subsidiary of, of Alphabet or Google. And what they're developing right now is a mass or a task system, mobility as a service or transportation as a service. And they have commercial taxi operations in both Arizona and California, but the program operates in six states and 25 cities throughout the country. So they've been um, pretty exciting to watch because they actually publish the amount of miles that they drive per year in full autonomous mode. And if you want to hit the next slide, and I think this one might require a click after it. So this is from 2009 to 2020. Whoops supposed to go a little bit slower. Um, but you can see that in, in 2014, they hit a million miles. It took them about six years to do that. And then in 2018, they hit 5 million, 2019, 10 million, and then 20 million in 2020. So really what they're doing is doubling the amount of miles that they drive per year in full autonomous mode, exponential growth. You can see the curve not just we showed before. Next slide, please. So if we take this, this is a, this is a big assumption right here, but if we take this and we start to, um, push this outward. So 20 million in 2020, we're at 100 million in 2022, a billion in 2025, 10 billion um, a little bit later than that in 2028, and then 40 in 2030. You can see that exponential growth, a majority of that happens in the last year that you're looking at. So it might not seem like a lot, and then all of a sudden, poof, it takes off. There's a lot that goes along with this. So this is this is just one company. This is, again, kind of a thought process to, to, to take a look at what this means, but um, something to point out. So within the United States or VMT, we're at about 3.4 trillion miles. And if you extend this curve out, you're looking at 2036 that this one company would hit that. Now, that assumes that they're gonna keep growing exponentially. That might not be the case, um, but also Nebraska, um, I have it written down, 21 billion miles is the, the VMT for the state of Nebraska. And you can see in 2029, this one company, if they keep going exponentially, could basically hit the same VMT as, as the entire state of Nebraska. So if you hit the next slide, please. 
some some key points to note on Waymo is is they've inked the deal with Chrysler to purchase 62,000 new Chrysler Pacifica minivans and an additional 20,000 all electric Jaguar I-Pace SUVs. So that's an investment of over two billion dollars in just the vehicles themselves, but their intent is to form or uh, um, uh, outfit those vehicles with with uh, their autonomous suite and to be able to operate those as an autonomous taxi service. And they they do have more miles driven than all the other competitors combined. That said, there's another company that I do want to, to mention, and if we can go to the next slide, and that would be Tesla. And this is a company that's not really often seen as one of the, the primary drivers of autonomous technology. Um, but one interesting to look at is in all the vehicles that they've produced in the last half of 2016 onward, had the capability for full self-driving. They have uh, redundant systems, they have all the, the visual um, cameras and, and the, a modular computer that can be replaced. And really what they're doing is every mile that's driven within one of these vehicles, they have the ability to see how the vehicle, see how the computer is reacting to the real world and then see how the human is reacting. So essentially what we're doing with their fleet of 50 or 500,000 vehicles that have this capability is training their algorithms to drive. We're, we're honestly training these cars or this system, their neural net, uh, to operate on 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 roadways, and they do so without things like high definition maps, which a lot of the other companies use. Um, also to mention as well, Tesla is growing their production exponentially too. So, um, you know, we're looking at the potential then for the company to to be producing more and more and more of these vehicles. They have the ability to do over the air updates, which means they could potentially flip the switch with the right hardware, and then you would have an enormous amount of of fully autonomous vehicles on the road today. That are that are uh, being owned by private individuals. So this is a company to to, to keep in mind. And and again, if we look at that exponential curve, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that Waymo is going to be the leader. It could be you know the fact that this company already has 50 or 500,000 cars in the fleet that can potentially run full autonomous. Go to the next slide, please. And really, what I want to do is tie this into. Um, land use and city development. So it's not really the vehicle that matters, it's the model that matters. When you look at transportation as a service and mobility as a service, what that means is that people are purchasing the mobility and not necessarily the machines. In the case of Tesla, it's a little bit different. Um, if we go to the next slide, what this means for our, our land use, and this is outside of the, the necessarily role of, of transportation, but if you look at the cost of current car ownership, you're looking at 60 to 70 cents a mile. There's been some studies done that say when you move to a mobility as a service mile, you're looking at 10 to 20 cents a mile. So you get a lot more efficiency out of, out of a trip in terms of cost than you would get with, with owning your vehicle. And that's kind of the all-in cost, insurance and maintenance and gas and, and the cost of the car itself. So obviously there's going to be a, a tremendous financial um, consideration that people make when they go to choose the trip. Uh, next slide, please. What that means for cities is parking. So if you take something like a building area of 400 square feet of, let's say, retail, and that's the typical you would require, let's say, a parking space per 400 square feet. That's that's a, a pretty loose um, requirement. So parking space is 10 by 20, so 200 square feet. But all in, you're looking at about 400 to 450 square feet of land area that it takes to actually uh, place that, that parking space on site. So for every 400 square feet of building area of usable square footage, you're using about another 400 square feet of, of site area to do that. Next slide, please. So really this, this starts and it ends with parking and this is a big detriment to development. It's a big detriment to density because basically it limits the amount that we can do on a site. Next slide, please. So we took a look at an area, this is in Columbus, but it has a mixture of retail, hotel, office, and a movie theater and try to understand where the actual land was being devoted to. Next slide, please. And we can look at 350 acres. Next one, sorry, this, these are flip through slides. Um, about 4% of that is, is roadway, 9% or 31 acres is building. This is the place where actually work is happening that, that has jobs, uh, that's generating tax revenue. We have green space at 32%. I use the, the, the word very loosely. Um, it's basically left over. And then approximately 55% of the site is parking or 192 acres. So if all of a sudden we're transporting people from owning their own machines that require a parking space to access these areas into a mobility as a service, you're opening up a tremendous amount of land in a lot of places throughout the United States for additional development. So all the areas that you see in blue could potentially be, and obviously this is um, over a, a fair amount of time, but an, an enormous amount of development 
potential within our urbanized areas in places that we probably think right now as, as being fully developed. So there's going to be economic consequences for that. There's going to be development consequences for that. And we have now the capability to build densely in a way that we don't when we design around the automobile. Uh, next slide, please. An example of this is uh, another spot in Columbus. This is uh, Polaris Mall. Um, but you can see around, this is just Omaha, there's places like this everywhere in the country. And the vast amount of parking that we see um, all has the potential now for, for redevelopment. And not development as we know it, but development that is now unconstrained by parking that doesn't require a duplication of the amount of area and parking to the building. We can we can build up rather than outward. And we can really get more bang for our buck in terms of infrastructure. Every mile of roadway that we put in the ground, we can support a heck of a lot more development density than we can um, when we design and we when we park around the automobile. Next slide, please. So I wanted to tie this back into how, how we really move this forward. So what this means for our cities is the ability to lower the overall demand for parking when the mode shifts to a mass or a task model. We get more gross flare area per, per acre, which means we get greater density per acre. We can build up. We can actually build places that, that people can walk to rather than require a, a car to drive back and forth from. And we get more developable land in areas that are already developed. Next slide. One of the things I've had the opportunity to work on is a project that's that's here in Lincoln, and that's the shuttle project. And, and really one of the key factors of this is the ability to take a look at, at how people are moving around the downtown right now and to try and link up some of those areas with things like uh, parking decks and some of the key um, uh, destinations like transit stops and the university and, and the state house and, and uh, the city offices. Next slide, please. And so really what this what this project was about was understanding how we can utilize these future technologies to um, to start to leverage things like greater development density, lower infrastructure cost. And really, this is a foot in the ground, right? This is the, the opportunity to, to say we're going to start to understand the capabilities of the technology, how people react to it and um, what level of interest we have from the community. So there was a public engagement part of this to understand um, people's kind of perception of autonomous technology before they get to interact with the vehicle and then they get to go for a ride and then we get to measure kind of what that change was after it and overall it's been something that's that's been uh, very positive among the Lincoln community people were pretty excited to see the technology right there in their town and to see it operating uh, without a driver so you know this is I always like to say this is kind of the Motorola StarTac of autonomous vehicles it's uh, not the most uh, advanced thing that we're going to see in our lifetimes and it's going to continue to evolve and it's going to continue to to increase its its uh, capabilities so something we look forward to continuing working with the city and, and hopefully establishing a, a service that can hopefully you know move people around the downtown in an efficient manner the slide i want to end on and this is usually what i start with but this is a map of europe and it's a great slide because it shows in yellow uh, the areas that are old Roman roads, and this was built, you know, 2,000, 3,000, uh, 2,500 years ago, and this is overlaid on top of um, the light pollution that we see coming from all these these urbanized areas, and you can see how well they match up. The roads, the and the transportation infrastructure that that this civilization built 2,000 years ago is 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 really affecting where we um, develop today and how we develop today. And transportation and land use are, are two things. It's not one that affects the other. They affect both. They, they both affect each other. And to the extent that we see improvements and movements and in, in different types of uh, transportation that are being adopted, those are going to have huge implications for our cities. And land use is, is one of those things. And um, I know the, a lot of other speakers touched on those earlier. And I think that, that as this happens, we have to think holistically about really what this means for our society and our civilization and, and what it means for those that are kind of uh, going to be uh, taking over from us 2,000 years in the future. So with that, I want to thank everybody and um, hope to hear some questions. Justin, thank you. Excellent presentation. That was uh, that was very good. Um, I love I love that you're in your attic uh, this morning. That's <laughs> excellent. And uh, as of, I'm only worried that uh, you know just as we're getting deep into June here that uh, you've got hopefully you've got good HVAC up there. I have about uh, until two o'clock, and it gets exceedingly hot up here. Yeah, excellent. Um, all right, so our last our last panelist this morning is Pete Gould. He is the founding partner of Catapult Policy Strategies, a Washington, D.C.-based policy consulting and lobbying firm that bridges the gap between mobility startups and the public sector to responsibly deploy innovative technology that improves cities and communities. 
Uh, Pete's got over 15 years experience in transportation and mobility technology policy from Capitol Hill, the US DOT, Uber, and uh, running a successful lobbying and consulting firm. Prior to founding Catapult Policy Strategies, Pete was Uber's senior tech, uh, transportation policy development associate where he tackled issues including autonomous vehicle policy, accessibility, and integrating Uber with transit agencies. Pete is also the co-host of Mobility Podcast, uh, which makes him, I believe, the only podcast uh, uh, presenter that we have on our panel today. So uh, uh, he's got thousands of influential listeners over there at Mobility Podcast uh, at all kinds of levels of government and all across the country. Uh, please welcome Pete. Pete, are you there? Yep, I'm here. Can you hear me? I can hear you and I can see you. Welcome Perfect. aboard. All right. That's all, that's all we need right now. Uh, so thank you guys uh, and everyone for joining us and, and for having me on. Um, what I, what I want to talk on, I think we'll, we'll touch uh, nicely on the last two pre presenters and also on the earlier panel, um, is when we're talking about shared autonomous vehicles or robo-taxis, we'll, we'll use just uh, for uh, brevity's sake. Um, you know, and and asking kind of, hey, why aren't they here yet? When are you know, where are they, and what what are the roadblocks? But then more importantly, is this a thing that's just going to happen, or how do we go about ensuring that it is shared rather than everyone personally owning their own Tesla that drives around? So uh, next slide, please. So the, for starters, the question you know we've heard is you know kind of where where's my flying cars that I was promised, or where are my robo taxis? Um, and recent developments have have you know we're we're in that trough of delusion uh, right now where um, or disillusionment where you or both uh, where you are you know what was a a, a tremendous amount of hype um, and and uh, confidence that this was coming any day now or next year um, has given way to to a little bit of reality and and we've seen some timelines slipping. Uh, GM crews uh, had a big, you know, a big bold bet that they were going to launch their their service by 2019. Um, obviously, that is, that has been delayed a little bit, um, and then we're seeing that with others. But at the same time, oh, I'm sorry. And then also, we have some of the smaller startups, companies that wanted to, you know, I'm going to become my, you know, I'm going to set my own uh, robo taxi. I'm going to create it. Uh, the technology from the beginning have found that it's a very expensive endeavor and. When the you know next wave of of VC funding doesn't doesn't appear, um, it quickly uh, it becomes a, a, a tough business to be in when you're really talking about a an R and D project uh, at this early stage. Um, what we've also seen too that's pulled a little bit of attention away, I think, from from the passenger AV uh, side of things, has been uh, some emphasis on on delivery robots or delivery autonomous vehicles. Um, for a number of reasons, one being that it, it might be easier when you're never going to have a human being in it, either a passenger or a driver, um, from a design standpoint, but also from a safety and and uh, embrace from from regulators and government um, in general that this might be a nice place to start. Um, but then we are also seeing some of the bigger players are still progressing. You know, it's we what we found is that it's less of a a you know sprint and that it's more of a you know this is tough and this is going to take a little bit of time um but we're making tremendous advancements in the kind of grand scheme of how fast uh you know this technology has been deploying we have seen tremendous advancements in the last you know half a de half a decade uh and obviously decade um but it just there's a what we're we're also finding is that that last five percent uh of of scenarios and capabilities is by far the hardest so um those are still progressing um uh, and you know i think we can still be hopeful that this might you know this is going to be a service that you'll be able to start seeing in, in some in some metropolitan areas you know say five years from now um and, and then lastly uh, um and our last presenter touched uh, justin touched on it uh with the the lincoln shuttle but these you know, these smaller uh, AV shuttles uh, really are on the road serving passengers, obviously in more limited um, uh, ranges, whether uh, from kind of typically they'll be on a, on a closed course or on a specific route that is, is predetermined for, you know, safety and simplicity. Uh, they're going at lower speeds. But what they are doing is helping us, uh, you know, helping the industry understand what are people looking for? What is the kind of in the in vehicle experience and needs, um, while also helping the, the public get that first you know sense of what is it like to be in an autonomous vehicle? So next slide. 
Um, what are the, the key, the big things that have run in, that have been speed bumps? I'll call them not barriers, but speed bumps. Uh, first, technology. This is hard. You know, I touched on that. Uh, and as you see in that picture, that you know, Uber and others have, have run into issues. Tesla itself, uh, you know, has still having trouble not running into the side of a, you know, of a large tractor trailer that happens to be perpendicular. Um, the, the, the other side of it, too, is the business model realities for a kind of shared on demand autonomous vehicle system might not be as simplistic and, and obvious as a great, you know, the early talk was if, you know, it's like Uber, but Uber has to pay 80% to the driver. So if you take the driver out, it's an 80% increase and they get all the money. What they also, you know, now become is a, they're purchasing the vehicle, they are fleet operators, they are, the, you know, the insurance, they are everything. Um, and so the, the, you know, the economic realities of that versus making an autonomous vehicle that an individual can purchase um, are, are starting to see a little bit of, of kind of uh, focus on the, on the finer, you know, the follow-up questions that go into that assumption. Uh, and then lastly, the lawyers, um, what, you know, I think what we're also finding is, okay, if something's ready to go, it's, there's the tech side of it, but then there's the, okay, if we're going to offer this to the public, and if you're a passenger, and this thing hits somebody who is then on responsible um same similarly for a personally owned if the technology is the driver whose insurance is paying for this and so i think there are a lot of liability issues um that i think are probably the biggest barrier to somebody you know to, to especially on smaller folks wanting to jump out just to be first next slide but so let's let's imagine these are coming and that they're coming soon um uh, next slide. And, and the question becomes, okay, so what are the critical questions to help it shape this away from that, you know, the nightmare scenario of everyone owning their own, driving everywhere, driving significantly more vehicle miles traveled, um, as many studies have already started to show. Uh, UC Davis had another uh, uh, great report recently just looking at uh, driver uh, Tesla owners uh, who have autopilot and that they, uh, you know, I think uh, the overall majority reported significantly greater VMT ridership just because it's easy and it's convenient. Um, and so when we talk about will the public share autonomous vehicles in the future, there's a couple key questions that I want to go through. I'll touch on them real quick here because there's a, a slide for each, but, you know, what are the operational requirements for a successful execution of a pooled rideshare service? Um, you know, and then next after that is how does, as the passenger, how does a ride being shared as opposed to a solo trip, meaning, you know, kind of Uber pool versus an Uber X, how does that impact my experience? Uh, and then I think the kind of rhetorical question and probably answered by the title of my, my slide is, you know, why would the absence of a human driver in the vehicle have any impact on my willingness or the public's willingness to share a ride more than I already do today? in a uber or even a taxi uh, and then the critical question i want to dive in on is what policies or changes could alter consumer behavior or encourage you know more widespread use of a shared model um of, of ride services as opposed to again personally owned um and then uh the you know i'm sorry yeah so let's let's move forward so what are the prerequisites for a viable shared service uh the key really is density and it's on a, mo on a number of different levels you need the density of riders as well as the density of vehicles. And then on top of that, you need those riders who, once you can connect them with a vehicle, you need their trips, multiple passengers trips to be going along the same routes. Obviously that, you know, in high density areas, that's where transit works great, where you are connecting what has been found to be, uh, you know, a high, high demand route. But for an on demand, you know, uh, system, you need a lot of that, and because without it, you're just offering a lower price uh, and not actually getting multiple passengers in the vehicle. Um, so the trip matching really does require a density, not only of you know in the way we typically said you know of, from a land use planning uh, perspective, but of the you know trips for the matching, um, because you also then uh, to be able to match a trip, you need to be able to have as much density of origins and destinations, because otherwise. You, you know, you to do so would help minimize the inconvenience of sharing um, and then also maximize that efficient use of the supply. Because if if I'm sharing with pass, if I'm passenger one and I get picked up in this and you're passenger two, it's a it, this route, you know, the route shown here is kind of the this is how Uber pool works great. 
that's a that's fine. But if passenger one is going six blocks the other way and then coming back and adding a half hour, then that is a big problem. Next slide. Uh, and then if you look at it from as the passenger, what is the you know the impact of me? The positive impacts are, are pretty clear. You can offer it at a lower price. You know, and along that spectrum, you go from the personal, you know, a personal solo trip that's up here to a public transit bus where you have, you know, uh, sharing it with a lot of folks and it's, you know, going to be the cheapest. Finding that sweet spot in between where, you know, you're maximizing the benefits to me in terms of price. Um, there's obviously great positive externalities in terms of environmental benefits, less congestion, uh, less parking and all of that. On the negative impact side, it means it's going to take longer it, just by its definition. It also means it's likely to be an indirect route unless it happens to be kind of identical. Uh, it adds additional stops. And then there's a lot of uncertainty in terms of the dynamic matching mid trip um, that you're going to, you know, while you are riding, going to get connected with someone and deviate. And that, as you can see, kind of uh, on the tops the, the, of the two images on the right, the top one shows, you know, here are your options. And the key number for me, is I'd say almost less so the price, but more if you look at the 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 ETA on the bottom of what time you're going to get there, um, and that's one of the I think an important factor here. Um, so next slide. So what are you know? So a lot of it again is so we have the existing world as we know it. We have transit, we have carpooling, we have van pools, we have a lot of these different you know. Uh, things and it obviously you know you're looking I was looking at the uh, study recent with for Omaha that you have 68 percent uh commute share of drives alone all the time you know it these are these are not new problems that only come up with autonomy this is the the fight that or, you know cities and urban planners have been trying to uh, and transit advocates have been trying to to kind of change human behavior to the positive and so what are the key policies I would say in terms of in enabling and encouraging and facilitating uh, autonomous vehicles being shared. I think taking transit out of traffic is critical. Bus only lanes, um, you know, providing them access to a road that is not stuck in the same traffic as me driving by myself. Um, and I think what you're really doing there, that last one on the right is called you're subsidizing time. So rather than focusing on the price, you're saying, hey, this is, you know, if you take this, you get to jump into this lane, you're actually gonna get there quicker by sharing. Um, and then the other two, uh, I think that are key is accurately pricing road use and parking. Um, so much of it is baked into everyday society and then provided to the, the consumer as free. Uh, and so it's really important that parking, especially, but also road usage is priced accordingly and giving cities and states the levers to do dynamic pricing based on not only vehicle type, but occupancy and time of day and all of that um, are really important. I'm running out of time, so let's, we'll go quick forward. Um, uh, next slide, sorry. Uh, so the key, what I, I think the point I want to make here is that if you, you'll notice from all of those, none of that has anything to do with autonomous vehicles. And so don't wait for robo taxis to suddenly be the time when we're going to make decisions that are different, but also sometimes tend to be a little bit politically hard or there's a hesitancy because you're trying to nudge people away from driving themselves. Um, do it now because if there is no difference just because it's robo taxis. In fact, the consequences just get so much worse because of the, the kind of exponential factor of, of BMT. And then next slide. Uh, and I just want to flag, I, I do think it's very critical that public transit be a, not only embracing, but be a core part of autonomy. And I want to alert that what, you know, there are many great parts of the bill that uh, are, is currently before Congress, the Invest in America Act. One thing I do want to flag is there's a, a section in here at 2603 that actually prohibits the use of any federal transit funds for an autonomous vehicle uh, deployment unless you can prove that it doesn't duplicate, eliminate, or reduce frequency of existing services, which basically would limit this off to nothing in the urban core and nothing. And I think it is a, it, I want to make sure this is aware and so that uh, we're reaching out and talking to members of Congress so that they know about the importance of transit as being a core function, because otherwise we will be pitting private robo taxi, like an Uber uh, autonomous vehicle against the existing public transit system as we know it. And I think it's, uh, it, it might be short, it'll be short sighted. So I, I apologize for going over and I look forward to uh, any questions and, and uh, comments. And, and please feel free to email me if you have any questions or, or would love to just connect. 
Excellent presentation, Pete. Thank you. Uh, so what we've got here is we've got about seven or eight minutes before we hit high noon, and this is scheduled to be over. So we've got about seven minutes for some discussion with our three panelists. And uh, again, I'd like to give Courtney uh, a crack, a first crack at, at our three panelists for any questions that, that uh, she might uh, have for them or anything that she would like to draw out of their presentations. Uh, Courtney, what have you uh, what have you got for our panelists? Uh, well, they're all very great presentations. This is sort of my my bread and butter with autonomous vehicles, or at least it used to be. One thing that um, I want to think about, and I want maybe some of you to speak to in terms of, you know, we're talking about you were talking about autonomous vehicles. This increase in VMT, which obviously was just, uh, you know, the panelists before was talking about the a major need for decreasing that. Um, and there's all, there's been a deployment. I call it the failed deployment timeline. So Waymo may be getting a lot of miles in right now. Um, Argo seems to be also ahead of the pack with, uh, you know, funding from BW and Ford having big OEMs behind them. But we know we see Zooks is now in talks with Amazon, um, and the 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 shuttle pilots are beginning to um, slow down. Uh, I know I was speaking to another DOT. Um, given the impact of COVID and, and finances, a lot of those um, potential pilots are being shuttered. So I'm wondering, you know, uh, there's this opportunity right now where, you know, AV is being slowed down. Everyone, uh, the, a lot of state DOTs were investing a lot of time and resources and planning for AVs. You know, I don't think we're going to see them for, you know, in full penetration, at least in terms of personally owned or, or robo taxis for quite some time. Um, so I'm wondering if there's anything you could talk about in terms of connectivity and your thoughts on connectivity as an alternative to serve the same goal as autonomous vehicles, uh, which would be, you know, increasing safety um, and being more efficient on and using our roads more efficiently um, without, you know, really putting um, without taking people out behind the driver's wheel and also um, you know, how would Nebraska, I'm, I'm clumping all my questions together, I'm sorry, but then how would Nebraska DOT uh, need to think about investment in terms of infrastructure? So, you know, spectrum, spectrum expansion and V2X um, installments around the state. Anyone want to take that AV decline opportunity for connected vehicles? Uh, well, this is pretty, I mean, I'll say, you know, again, my kind of key point here is that the some of the most fundamental um, policies here aren't really specific to the technology of it. Um, and, you know, I think there's a, a lot that we should be doing based on what we know is here and what's, you know, actually going on, um, rather than necessarily trying to kind of shoot the puck to where the guy's skating when we actually don't, you know, when we don't know exactly where the guy's skating. You know, I do still think that so much of the of the um, important aspects of this are going to be based around core principles around as, you know, as many folks have wrote on land use on how do we ensure that we're not, you know, setting us up so that, that uh, you just have these super commutes. And I, and I think really that's where that that key uh, emphasis right now has got to be. Um, because the, then from there, you know, I think you do let the tech uh, work within the system that it has um, in terms of serving the city and the state more broadly. Yeah, and I think also I just want to add that I was speaking to um, another state DOT, getting some feedback on the new FHWA safety initiative, which is um, really it's not really a, it doesn't provide a framework. It just is more of a conversation around uh autonomous vehicles uh policy and manufacturers technologists so i think it's worth also mentioning that you know in terms of timing thinking 20 years ahead we it, you know we've been working on trying to get a federal framework for the last you know almost uh seven years i would say in, in earnest um so that's still something that's a, a little bit out and, and i also want to bring up uh, justin to your to your presentation again, I'm going to bring up the flooding because I know it's a big deal in Nebraska. You know, you showed the 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 aerial shot of 
Omaha and the vast swaths of parking. So, I, you know, there's just even thinking about, you know, different land use patterns that could help mitigate these immense flood risks that Nebraska faces. Mm -hmm. uh, even, you know, urban is going to be less permeable than rural. So I think that's something um, just maybe you could talk to. Yeah, I think that's that's a good point. Um, there's there are studies that were done, and it changes on what you're looking, obviously. But um, typically, that 50 percent of of land area that's been developed um, that's not unusual even for a downtown core. So there's a mass amount of a huge amount of of um, uh, surfaces that that you know don't let water into the. Uh, impermeable surfaces that don't let water in, into the ground. So when we're talking about flood events, when we're talking about rain events, um, the more parking we have, the more impermeable surfaces that we have, obviously that, that has implications for how um, the speed with which water is shed off of those areas. So if we can reduce parking, that's, that's, a, that's a huge issue. I mean, parking is probably the, the number one uh, hindrance for development. In, in almost any context, and it's something that's that's really difficult to wrap your mind around, especially if you start laying out sites, you can kind of understand the the scale of it. Um, but it's not something that's particular just to suburbanized areas. It's urban. It's it's rural as well. I mean, there's there's a lot of parking in this country. Yeah, and not just the supply, but the pricing of it and the like. It's you know we're we're almost pulling people to drive by making it so easy, uh, and in doing so, also just kind of wasting so much public space right and that's that's the problem too is once you build around parking once you build around that that model of development it basically does so the detriment of everything else it's a lot more difficult to run transit in uh suburban style development it's a lot more difficult to to you know put biking facilities and, and pedestrian facilities nobody wants to walk in between a freeway and a parking lot um those are not walkable pedestrian areas so um, you know, we build around the car and you're basically stuck having that mode of transportation to service those land uses. Yeah, you know, I, I think it's helpful to also think about uh, what that means for some of the small towns and rural areas in Nebraska. You know, historically, a lot of these small towns, they came about as part of the railroad railroad system. And so these were like originally transit oriented developments, essentially. So and, and there are so many incredible Nebraska towns that have beautiful main streets that just, they can't attract business and then, you know, they can't really maintain themselves because the highway is 30 miles away. And I think coming back to some of that can help the extend this conversation into the rural areas. Um, and actually, you know, coming back to Courtney's earlier question um, or about uh, connectivity, I think if people are able to work remotely in some of these smaller communities and these smaller communities offer some of the walkability and livability benefits, um, without having to commute long distances. Um, I think that that is a, a, a long term sort of uh, recipe for success for these places. Great. And I also just want to mention um, just two things really quickly that sort of tie both panels together. One is that uh, Lyft announced that they were going to be going all electric, which will be interesting since they're personally owned vehicles. And Pete, uh, you, is the target 2030? Which which announcement this time or three years ago? This one, the oh, recent one. 2030. Uh, 2030. Yeah. Um, and then uh, I also just wanted to talk a little bit about tying AV freight into the urban environment. So there's been yeah. a lot of um, technology companies working on platooning and also. Uh, you know, doing automated freight, just the trucks are automated in themselves. And what what we saw was with one of the major funding funded ones, Starsky Robotics, you know, they thought that they could operate the trucks. Um, they would take them out of AV mode and operate them kind of remote controlly. It's called tel teleops, teleoperations. Um, and, you know, there was definitely some physics issues with that. Um, and some latency issues, meaning the connectivity of the people that would be sort of in the cloud managing that truck driving in urban areas, you know, there could be there could be a breakdown very easily. We know how much difficulty we have even just signing into webinars, right? So um, that company actually shut down. I believe it's for sale. Uh, but it's 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 shuttered its, its doors. So this sort of connection of freight into urban is still a, a huge nut track. Um, but I think you know 
with everyone sort of coming together with the case, you know, the connected, automated, shared, and electric uh, here today. So I'm wondering if anyone from Nebraska DOT, Curtis, if you have any questions or comments or would like to hear more, perhaps offline. Courtney, I got actually one more point on the freight uh, and electrification concept. One thing not to overlook right now is the, the the role that I think electric bicycles can be playing, not only in commuting but also on the these particularly the delivery. What we're seeing so much right now is you know basically the restaurant industry industry has been converted just to survive into a high you know significantly more focused on the delivery side. Doing that, especially uh, at a local level, doing that with e-bikes over even personally owned cars and is a huge short-term, uh, I think, area of focus, but also there's a long-term uh, opportunity there because the e-bike really does expand access to biking as a mode of transportation for a lot of people who might not see a, a kind of a pedal, a, a regular pedal bike as an option, um, both from range and effort and, and ability. So uh, I think that's, the, that's another area where I, I've been looking a lot lately and, and I think there's a lot of opportunity there. That's a yeah, direct, you, one to one I, I'm curious, it. Dan, can you speak to that a little bit? I mean, I, I understand e-bikes will basically expand people's reach in terms of how far they can travel. So I know you're more local and, you know, places outside of Omaha. How do you think through e-bikes and their impacts um, in terms of people getting around? I mean, I, you know, I, I think they're, uh, they're, they're, they're pretty huge for a couple of reasons. So I, first off, I, I think in the U.S., when we talk about things like moss, we tend to leave out e-bikes and scooters and all that stuff. But, you know, um, that side of shared mobility systems, I think, really has so much great potential that we didn't get uh, as much of a chance to talk about today. But um, when, it, when it comes to e-bikes specifically, you know, distances can be longer. Um, but the other thing that what the research is showing is that the barrier to entry with e-bikes is a lot lower. And this is really good for groups like aging populations or, you know, people who wouldn't normally ride or are nervous about riding. And so getting more people out there on bikes is really helpful and useful. And we're seeing that happen. Um, the distances are obviously people are going to be able to go longer distances, but that's going to depend on having safe infrastructure. Um, so, so that's something that we need to think about. And I, I think for NDOT that involves thinking about like safe crossings for, you know, some of uh, here in Lincoln, we have a lot of, um, like rail trail conversions and things like that. And we need to really make sure those those crossings are, are in good shape if we're looking at more and more people uh, riding bikes there. But um, yeah, as Pete said, if for delivery already in, um, you know, in, in bigger cities and, and, you know, and in Northern in particular, you see e-bikes for delivery have just taken off and there's no reason for them to not do the same here. I think it's just a matter of time. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, um... For you know, a state DOT specific focus, the TAP program. One one really great thing about the uh, Invest in America Act that Congress is uh, talking about right now is that it places a very not you know it places a very heavy emphasis and expanded funding and everything for the TAP program. And just seeing bicycle facilities and both you know bike protected bike lanes on on kind of major streets, but also just like the whole uh, you know a whole rail or um, a whole trail um and and dedicated bike facilities really i think it's really important to see that not as a recreational thing or a you know something for the bike people um but it, it really i do believe within cities and also from a suburban uh commuting standpoint there are legit um long-term opportunities here to really make that a core part of, and should be treated as a core part of the of regional mobility yeah, and i think I, that that kind of goes on to another another question as well of, of the right of way. And I think at the beginning of the um, uh, webinar, somebody mentioned we have a, a finite um, capacity within our right of way. And with all these modes coming online and potentially operating within our streets, the question is how do those start to overlap in certain areas? When things like robotic delivery um, become more popular or when we talk about e-bikes, you know, we got to figure out exactly how our right of way is now divided up and that could potentially be more categories for how that happens. Uh, this is Curtis again, and I'm just popping in here to say, I, I, again, I want to thank all of our, our panelists. They did an excellent job. It was a great discussion that we had. Um, 
great presentations all around. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to, uh, it's about seven minutes after, after high noon here, and I'd like to, uh, we did have a few questions pop in, but I'd like to kind of, I mean, in general, I'd like to wrap this up. I know people got places to go and places to be. So um, I want to thank everybody who's an attendee for this and sticking around. And I would like to also remind you that this, this is being recorded, and so it will be made available to you as like a podcast. There's a video that you can watch later uh, on demand at your convenience. And so, but there were a few questions that came in that I'd like to get to, and uh, one of which came from uh, David Rich. Uh, David is the, um, let's see, he's the sustainable energy manager for Nebraska Public Power. And uh, he had a question that I believe would be more so directed at the first uh, group of panelists, but I believe it was, um, it seems it was fairly uh, open-ended. Uh, so he asked uh, you know, that we have seen very limited additions of DC fast chargers due to the economics of high electric costs associated with high demand charges with low monthly kilowatt hours. Um, uh, I don't know if anybody, if anybody on the panel would, would like to speak to that. Uh, I don't know if Dave had um, anything additional he wanted to get to with that. Um, Dave, we can unmute you if you're still on. Is Dave still on? Dave is actually off. So um, I don't know if anybody has anything that they want to add to with that or, or just put a little bow on that comment. Um, you know, limited additions with DC fast chargers due to high, the economics of high electric costs associated with, you know, high demand monthly kilowatt hours. Is that, uh, where, where does that put us? Hey, this is Sue at um, Electrification Coalition. I, I think, you know, the demand charges are a concern and can be a barrier to adoption. And what we've seen that's been promising is some really um, efforts um, to work with utilities um, closely to figure out, you know, how to address the needs of the um, you know, the chargers, um, the, the vehicles and the charging, um, and think about the impacts on the, on the network. And, um, so I'd say that's something that, you know, is worthy of, um, looking into a little bit more. And, and, and in some cases, utilities have waived demand charges, um, on a temporary basis and some other things like that. And there's also some opportunities for better sort of quote, smart charging, you know, to do it at a time and spread it out in a way that, um, um, you know, make sense for for the system uh dave does that uh does that help elaborate with anything with your comment question so so you, you can hear me yes uh so yeah, we can hear you okay the one of the challenges is i believe that we may need some state legislation to allow utilities to set up uh, differentiated rates for dc fast chargers uh, otherwise, we have pretty limited ability to do something like that. Okay. Well, that sounds like a good policy uh, effort to work on. <laughs> yes. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> also, we had uh, Blake Hansen had written a question into the into the question and answer uh, kind of portion of the chat box down below. Uh, Blake is with Olson Associates, which is a regional uh, engineering consultant here in the area. And uh, he did have his question. His question was for Dave, and uh, his question was answered in in that chat. But I just wanted to touch base with with Blake and see if if um, if, he, if that question was answered sufficiently. Is Blake still on, Kelsey? Oh, he must have just jumped off. Okay. Um, uh, yeah. So, anyways, we can move on from that. And the last question we had was from Stephen Osberg, and and Stephen had a question for Ben Holland. Stephen is the uh, transportation director for our Omaha Chamber of Commerce. So uh, Stephen's usually a little bit more um, focused on urban, urban policies and whatnot. So his question for Ben Holland was, um, you know, what specific policies could the state DOT pursue to help reduce VMT, vehicle mile traveled, in the more urban areas of Nebraska? So Ben, um, if you do, you, do you have any suggestions for, for Stephen? Can you take him off mute? I, yes, I think I don't see Ben on the line anymore. Oh, did Ben have to go? Okay, we are we are uh, past the, a lot of time. Ben must have had a, a, another engagement to get to. Okay, so so all right, one out of three. Um, Can I make a comment on that last question? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, urban areas in particular. I think um, what you can be focusing on is in access to destinations without having to drive. 
And I, I think that the solution is actually to have fewer land use policies. Uh, you know, we have a number of land use policies in place that make it hard to have live, live work units and mixed use development and build ADUs and things like that. So I think removing some of the existing land use requirements could be really helpful there. Okay. Real good. Um, I think I think we can wrap it up. I want to thank again. I want to thank our panelists. I want to thank everybody who attended. Uh, it, it went real well. It was uh, very good presentations. Very good topics. Uh, very everybody was engaged real well. Uh, thank you very much again, and uh, we'll see we'll see you all next week. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.